Welcome to the channel. This video is going to be pretty interesting. Um, typically, I have people that I've worked with, um, I ask them questions about the recovery journey. I have Nico here with me. Nico and I, um, we've known each other for a while, so we're going to change it up a little bit. Nico's gone through the mentorship. I've known him outside of the mentorship, and he's really just going to be asking me some questions this time. Um, some questions that you guys may have had pressing about uh, someone who's gone through this. I know I've talked to my story a lot, but there's a lot, a lot of parts probably missing from my story and also me as a coach. So with that said, let's get it started. Was that, a, was that okay? Should I redo it? Yeah. All right, so Nico, I mean, we kind of decided to do this last minute. Uh, Nico, what kind of burning questions did you have about, you know, during the mentorship or anything like that, really? I think on a, on a personal level, like, what, what was it that, what was the compulsion that made you decide to take just come, overcoming anxiety? and then turn it into something where it was that you could help other people? What was the compulsion to help yeah. other people? Um, so, I never had the intention of helping anybody through this. My, just, my goal was getting out of it and coming out with scars that nobody could see. Uh, my biggest thing was I had a small group of people. I had my family and maybe one or two friends that I talked about anxiety. I didn't talk to anybody else. I didn't want anyone else to know. My biggest, my biggest thing was just getting out because I, I'm telling you, Nico, when I was going through it, there was not a lot of talk about people recovering. There wasn't. You know, I always say there was Claire Weeks who was dead and there was uh, Paul David. I don't even know this guy was real or not. I didn't know if it was a 13 year old kid in a basement or if it, like we didn't, I didn't know his face or anything like that. Now, no disrespect to Paul David. He's one of my heroes, you know, he was, he was a huge inspiration, but you know, it was through blog form. You know, I didn't know what his life was like. I didn't know too much about him besides the fact that he wrote this book. And so my biggest thing was just coming out. Once I came out, I never had the intention of helping people, honestly. Um, it was always something that I wanted to do, but I just was never interested in the therapy route. Um, one of the things I did learn about anxiety though, one of the things I did learn from this experience is I wanted to help improve quality of life. I just didn't know which domain. Um, one of the ways I thought about it was through technology when we were at Apple, and then I was focused on healthcare technology. I left Apple to do healthcare tech. And it wasn't till about maybe a couple of years ago when I recognized something where I was like, okay, it's different now than when it used to be. And the reason why is because of the internet. And with the internet, with high speed internet, with you know, internet 2.0, now I could communicate with anybody around the world. And so I was like, you know, if we can figure out a way to help people around the world virtually, and get them out of this. I just need to fix one problem. I don't need to fix a million different problems. I just need to fix one. What is one problem I'm really good at that I feel like I can really fix? It happened to be anxiety. Um, and so at that time, um, <laughs> I still feel that um, a lot of the people that were talking about anxiety, I didn't think we're doing a great job of it. Like I thought, like I didn't think the content was that great. I didn't think they were really adding much value. And I felt like I personally could add more. So this was in Italy of 2019, I think. And I just had the idea and I said, you know what? I'm gonna try to do this through the internet. I'm gonna get people to recovery. That's my only job. I don't think I come across too many people online that are as adamant as you are about the fact that this is a recoverable yeah. thing yeah every other person that is big in the space is just like 
they're they're very much so about like self love, which is great. Yeah. They're very much so about like calming and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But a lot of it is about coping mechanisms mm -hmm. and learning how to live with this monster that is constantly going to be terrorizing you in some form throughout the rest of your life. But it, it's curious in in your content. I think you pretty consistently yeah. are very adamant about disagreeing with the idea that this is a that this is a diagnosis that is permanent that it will it will do you in yeah and the thing was is that it was so frustrating when i was going through this because similar people were saying different similar things it was just like different context rather than instagram or or youtube or you know some info product it was through blogs and stuff like that but they were saying the same thing and it was so infuriating Nico, because I'm sure you know too, that it was like, I just wanted to get out. Like this was like, I knew this was a community that I didn't belong in. And I, I felt, and I'm curious about actually, I'm gonna reverse, I'm yeah. gonna do a reverse card on you. I've always, I feel that, you know, to a certain degree, recovery comes from within. Yeah. Even going through the mentorship, one of the things the mentorship shows you is that you don't need the mentorship. Yep. When recovery comes from within, I personally don't feel other people have your best interest in getting you better. I don't feel, it's not that, it's not that they don't have, it's not that like they have bad intentions for you. It's not like they want you to suffer. I just feel like that it's not in their best interest to get you to recovery. Because why tell you that recovery comes from within, you can do it, when I can just sell you a, CBD product mm. and get 15% off code using my coupon and you use that for life. Like what's the incentive of me telling you that recovery comes from within? I felt recently, I don't think this program could have been done 10 years ago. I don't even know if it could have been done five years ago. I think because of the internet, this was something that could have been done. The product of the program is your recovery, Yeah, but not it's not like something, it's not something you always have to keep buying. Well, it's like a car that never breaks or yeah. anything like that. Like if you build it, it will arguably be the best product out there. But at the same time, the company will eat itself because you never have to get another car. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I'm, I'm one of the first people to say that capitalism is the best economic form that we've come up with thus far. Mm -hmm. But there are huge failures in it. And one of them is exactly this, is that it yeah. doesn't incentivize things like this where, where you're producing recovery. I, I was going to, to ask you why it is you think that, that other people are not so adamantly saying that you can recover from it, but it sounds like to an extent you kind of answered that, but, but I don't necessarily... I don't, I don't know. Yeah. What's, your, what's your take on that? Because it sounds like you're not necessarily saying that people are like that they have bad intentions with it or anything like that. It's just like the, the default kind of guides you towards not finding recovery for people when you can continue to like, when the coping is helping them and you can keep doing that in perpetuity. Yeah. Is there, what are, what are your thoughts around that? This is an industry that's been established. I think this whole idea of helping people recover, like I say, couldn't have been done until recently. Because if you think about it, historically, okay, you want to help somebody, you sell them something, you give them something. And there's no need to show them autonomy because, see, the reason why we can do this now is because now I can work with the globe. I can work with the world. I can work with 7 billion people. But before the internet, I was only constricted to my city. And so there was a finite number of people. So it was just better to sell something. Um, so I, th I just think we come from a culture of selling something. And the second point is, is that the anxiety community is, it's very weird. The industry is very weird. The best coaches in the world, you may have never heard of them because they're not great marketers. Hmm. And the people that are the best marketers can be absolute terrible coaches. And so the truth is, is that a lot of times, most people that you see that are talking the most about anxiety are just marketing anxiety. They're not actually helping people. So let's say someone's a YouTuber. Their job is to create YouTube content about anxiety, but they're not in the pits of helping people recover. 
while somebody who's dedicated to helping people recover probably doesn't have time to make videos. It kind of almost seems like that idea of, of stopping at awareness. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, you have, and, and so it's a weird industry. And so when somebody's struggling, who do I listen to? Yeah. You know, this guy, you know, the people that are, that you will find on the internet are always the loudest, but just because it's the loudest doesn't mean it's right. Yeah. And just because it's information doesn't mean that there's not misinformation. So I think because of that, most people that are focused on recovery, you just don't hear about them. You just don't know these people because they're just helping people recover. And when these people recover, they're not on the forums. Mm -hmm. They're not they're on social media lives. talking about yeah. recovery. They're just living their life. Yep. Who do you see on the forums? People that are struggling people that aren't going out of it. And who do you also see? The people that are selling coping crutches. Do you think part of it though too is, is that like, just people's general distrust with a, with a product that seems too good? Yes. Because it's like if, I, I don't know, it, it feels, it's, it's hard to, especially when you're in it, it's hard to believe that that you can recover fully from it when yeah. everybody else around you is telling you that like, no, this is just a thing. You have to take a pill for the rest of your life yeah, and now yeah, you're yeah. gonna feel better. You have a chemical imbalance, which those don't exist, but that's, <laughs> that's my pulpit. Yeah, 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 no, uh, I agree. But, you know, and I feel like, I remember I took a bunch of supplements during my, and they all same. said anxiety relief. Yep. And it was like, oh my God, this is all I need to take and then I'm out of this. Oh my God, this was the miracle pill. This is the miracle cure. This is the quick fix. And then what happens is, is that people fall into that trap so much that, you know, when somebody says recovery is possible, there's a natural skepticism because they've been wrong so many times. And I honestly feel once you hit a certain low point, the pain of being wrong again is more, is stronger than the possibility of it being right. Mm -hmm. And you just can't deal with another loss again. Yeah. Um, that was a big part. I remember feeling that. I remember even with, you know, Claire Weeks and Paul David, there was a natural skepticism with me because it was like, you, these guys are saying it's too good. And you know, it sounds too good to be true that like for me, good to be true was just, I can recover. Mm -hmm. I didn't care how long it took, but the fact that I could do it. And so I, I kind of didn't want to get my hopes up too high because every time I did that, I crashed. And so, you know, but you know, that was what it was. Luckily that was all I needed. Yeah. And, you know, that got me out. Earlier in the conversation, you were kind of talking about this idea of, of shame that you had felt around like you being somebody who was going through anxiety or, or dealing with anxiety. What, what is it that you think was the genesis of that? Why, yeah. why was it that you, you didn't want other people to know what it is that you were going through? And, and what, what is it that you think made you drop that to the point to where now you're putting stuff out on the internet mm -hmm. for, for people to see that you did in fact have anxiety. Yeah, right. Yep. <laughs> That's the weird paradox. Um, you know, I studied psychology in college and I, I, we, looked at, we looked at anxiety as like an illness, as a disorder, as a mm -hmm. disease almost. Definitely a disorder. Um, and so I always grew up with thinking like, you know, I, I feel like growing up to a certain degree, I was pretty fearless. I was pretty like, that was one of my things about me. Like I was fearless. There was a lot of things, you know, the second I turned 18, I, I left home and I went abroad and I was gone for like five years. And I was just like, I was just like this outgoing person. I used to, uh, do a lot of performances and stuff. Um, and so I never identified with anxiety. Um, then when this happened, it was something I'd never felt. And I was concerned that if it was anxiety, I automatically associated it as a character flaw. And just from my past experience in life, I was so outgoing that I just couldn't, like you know, my mom had a really hard time believing it was anxiety. Cause my mom was like, this was such a fearless kid. Mm -hmm. He was so, I was the guy that would like just jump on the roof and my mom would be like, oh God, this guy's gonna hurt himself. This kid's gonna hurt himself. And I was just fine. I was carefree. I would like swing on trees. And so when it was like, it was anxiety, I was like, I took that as a personal like character flaw and I wanted it to be something physical. 
Because at least if it was physical, it wasn't fault. It wasn't me. Mm-hmm. Now, if it was anxiety, no, it was me. Oh, no. It was behaviors that I had. And I wasn't willing to accept that. And so I wanted it to be something wrong. And I wanted it to be something besides anxiety. And I also learned I was so lucky. Like, you know, that was one time where I really wished it wasn't. And now looking back, I'm so glad that wish didn't come true. Yeah, you know? totally. Like, can you imagine if every wish came true? No, that you I, ever had? I had felt that same way. Yeah. I had totally felt that same way that it, it was like, it was just something that like I I wanted the fault to be elsewhere. Yeah. I, I wanted it to be anywhere except on, on me. And again, that kind of touches on the idea that it's like, ultimately, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Exactly. It's, but, but what I like about those situations, and I, I think maybe you could speak to this as well, but I feel like when you have that strong sense of identity with something like, something like fearlessness mm-hmm. or bravery or courage or strength or whatever, like when you get hit and experience anxiety in these extreme capacities, it really knocks you out of your, out of your life in, in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. Like it, it takes you off balance because it was something that you defined yourself by before and now all of a sudden it feels like the way that you defined yourself for years up to that point was a total lie. Mm-hmm. And I think overcoming that, you, you kind of have to find, find a way to, to be like, be a person that, that takes what it is that they have and, and recognizes that ultimately the thing that makes you you, that makes you powerful or strong or whatever, you have to understand that nothing can ever really take that away. Yeah. And, and I think anxiety teaches you that in, in those extreme circumstances. And, you know, speaking of identity, you know, I, one of the biggest things I learned is if you're identified with anything, good or bad, mm-hmm. ego will protect it. And one of the biggest mm-hmm. things, you know, we, we grew up learning about the intellect, which is knowledge. But one of the things is like, you know, if knowledge is a knife, um, identity is the, the hand. <laughs> and so you have to be careful about what your identity is. And I learned very quickly about if you're identified with something, it skews your reality. And so one of the things I try to do is not be too identified with anything. Yep. Because if I'm not identified, like I don't, I like, you know, people say, Sean, you've helped me with recovery. That's awesome. Cool. I don't really take that too seriously. I also say people on like forums, on Reddit forums that talk bad about me and they're like, this guy's a scammer. I don't take that too seriously either. I try not to be identified with either. My biggest thing is how do we get people to recover? How do we get people to get out? And so with, um, once I realized that it wasn't a character flaw, then my biggest fear was what are other people going to think? So I just don't want other people because they're not going to understand this. And I'm not really interested in explaining people. So I'm just not going to tell anybody. But then when I decided to commit that I'm going to help people overcome, then I had to come clear that, look, I'm going to have to share my story. And I was so concerned that if I shared my story and if this didn't work, now everyone knew my story. And what was the point of it? Mm -hmm. And the ironic thing was I shared my story. I keep sharing my story. I don't know a single person that's ever came up to me and be like, oh my God, you struggle with anxiety. Everyone always is so happy. They're so appreciative. They're like, like, Sean. Oh, me too. <laughs> they were like, that, yeah, they're all like, me too. I can't believe it, Sean. Yep. That's incredible, the work you're doing. Like, and like, I'm not trying to like flex on, but I'm like, they really say that. And I'm like, wow. Like, I really looked at it. You know, there was this one, um, there was this one person in the very beginning. This was when I first started. I don't even think I had a channel. She said something. Uh, she said, you know, Sean, the fact that you talk about your vulnerabilities makes you more of a man than most of these guys that yeah. are just like not trying to talk about it. Brene Brown has a great analogy about that where she talks about how um, being, being vulnerable yeah. is, is in fact like the idea of vulnerability. If you have a suit of armor on, you're not particularly vulnerable, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you go into a gladiatorial arena and there's two people in there, one person who is completely stripped down, has no armor, nothing like that, and there's a person that's suited up in armor, who is the braver person? Yeah. You, and in, in a lot of ways too, like you, you have to show yourself in order to be seen. 
and, exactly. and people can't connect with you and you can't find the answers you're looking for if you're constantly closing yourself off from letting them see you. And it was the same principles that I learned from anxiety, mm -hmm. which was, okay, you're feeling uncomfortable sharing it. What's the right thing to do? And the right thing to yep. do was no. This isn't about you, Sean. This yeah. isn't about how you feel and what you think people are going to think. Your goal is to help others going, getting out of this. Yeah. And so I said, okay, well, that's the goal. Then I'm just going to share my story. And I knew my family members were watching it. I knew my friends were watching it. And I just had to just keep my head down and focus on it. And, you know, it's it's nothing at all. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing. I mean, I keep getting messages. We meet people that are going through it too and they start reaching out. I mean, it was, I mean, every fear I had about this was demystified just yeah. by going into it. And I love what you said about identity too, because there was a, I, I remember having it explained to me before the idea of like, why it is that you, why it is that we as people take offense to, to different things. And and it was basically like, if I, if I were to say to you, Sean, you're a crazy purple alien. Yeah. What yeah. would you think of that? Right. Like, you'd just be like, this is an insane person that's yeah, talking yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the only reason that we take things in any form of offense is because to some way we identify with it. You don't identify yeah. as a crazy purple alien. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and so for, for you, that's like, what? Yeah. And, <laughs> And it's, uh, it, it's true, like I, identifying, too closely identifying with these different things, tying it into who you are fundamentally as a person, it, it can yield some very powerful effects in both directions, but you, you do need to see that like we, we are creatures that can kind of like ebb and flow through different things at different, yeah. different times. We can be different people. We can, that's what's beautiful about the human condition and I think what, what allows people to connect with other people's stories and why it is that we are storytellers as as animals you know right. that like because we're always talking about the idea of death and rebirth and right. cycles of transformation and that's totally what this is we can reinvent ourselves yeah tomorrow if i wanted to be a different person if you wanted to be a different person you can choose to do that tomorrow it, it, it's one of those things you can you can choose to be the person you want but you but you know you also have the clarity that you know like you know I look at myself as now somebody who helps people getting over anxiety you can call me an anxiety healer I I do that but I'm not identified with it um, you know what's the number one surefire way where if somebody wants to work with me and I'm like there's no help for there's no hope for this person the one the like I I don't say I'm very hopeful I'm like anybody can recover but if somebody says this one thing around me. No, nothing can help them. I'll say, I, I'm not even going to waste my time helping this person. It is, Sean, I'm just an anxious person. Hmm. When they say that, nothing I can do. I've done it in the past. I've tried to help those people. They've gotten better. They'll sabotage themselves and they won't even realize they're doing it. When those, that is, if somebody says that, I can't do anything. I can live with that person and tell them to do everything and they'll do it and they won't get out. Yeah. Because it's that identity that pulls them in. And that was the biggest yep. fear of mine. Luckily, I think growing up, I was so fearless that I knew this wasn't me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so luckily, I had that, that distinction that like, no, 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 I haven't gone through this. This isn't normal. Um, you know, a lot of people that go through it for a long time or have maybe had some history of behaviors, it's harder to disconnect from that. But I, it's, still, it's still possible. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. And I remember before when I was having trouble with it, when I wasn't working with you, I was going through um, trauma therapy mm -hmm. and it was a group setting. And I think one of the hard parts about that was when I started getting better, you, you see very clearly that people have a tendency to fight more for their misery than yep. they do for their, their hope and for their health. It, it's, a... it's very, very difficult. But that's definitely not to say that it's impossible or it's hopeless or anything like that. It's just you have to understand that nature about human beings to yeah. see it in yourself and recognize that it's something that has to be challenged that it's not something that you just leave there and allow to to be that is that is one thing that you should not allow that is it. <laughs> <laughs> that no i mean that part you said about misery is 100 percent correct because i mean i i was i was pretty naive man i thought like yeah i i i, I that's one thing that still kind of surprises me that some people sometimes will rather stand there. They're, they're committed to their misery. Um, 
I don't like saying that too much on the channel because then people get creative and they're like, oh, am I doing that? Am I doing that? Yeah. Um, that's not really the case. I mean, this is people that I'm working with more on a deeper level. Um, sometimes I will find that, you know, they're, this person's doing right. And, you know, and, and, and it's interesting, Nico, I can't push them too far because if I push them too far, they'll run away. Yep. I can only push them so much. Yeah. But then if they decide not to take the leap, I can't do anything because if I push them off the ledge, they're never going to come back to see me, uh, but they yeah. have to make that jump. And so it, it gets very, and it's very hard for the coaches and myself, like Kaylee yeah. and Cesar and Mirka. That was a hard lesson for me too. And I'm not yeah. even doing any kind of like coaching at, mm. at any capacity. Yes. I, I like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it was a hard one for me too, because yeah. I, I am just a person who just by, by default wants to help other people. Mm -hmm. And when I made that recognition that like, people will will fight more for their misery f than for their health i kind of had to to back off and recognize that the best that we can do for each other is just give information yeah share our stories give information and and people will come to it when it's when it's right because i think everybody needs to kind of like connect the dots on their own they need to they need the stars to line up in the right spot for them and and when they're ready to hear that information it'll click. Yeah. I, I remember there were conversations that I had years and years and years in, in the past that like, that all at once kind of like connected yeah. and opened the door for me to, to healing in, in so many different capacities, shows that I had watched literally hundreds of times that there was like a quote that was in it yeah. that just hit me so different. Yeah, yeah, Even yeah. though I had seen it hundreds of times, yeah. I just, I, I had seen it, I heard it but I had never listened to it but I feel like that's the case for a lot of people probably the the last thing that I would ask you that I'm curious about with you is um what what is the what is the end goal what is the and not necessarily the end goal but what are the yeah. the aspirations what in an ideal world yeah. would you like to see happen with what it is that that you're doing what is your your place here oh yeah oh that's a secret but i will i will <laughs> share it uh, i'll share it it's not really a secret i mean it, it, it's yeah. something we talk about actually a lot yeah um right now we have the mentorship we're guiding people through it um our next step is helping people in marginalized communities where you know it's not even about affording the mentorship they don't even have basic things like you know you know, finance, they don't even have basic essentials. Um, I'm, I'm focusing on helping out those communities um, because they just have no resources. Yeah. And so, you know, we're working on that. Then I think the next phase, what I'd like to focus on is focusing on the education system. Because I think, you know, once somebody trips and falls, it is a little bit harder to get them out. If we had just taught people a little bit earlier what a panic attack truly was, what derealization is, what depersonalization is, how to use the mind, how the mind works. Not just from like a, like a neuroscience perspective, this is the prefrontal cortex, this is the, you know, this so-and-so gyrus, this and that, but no, like how does the mind work? And I think one of the things we look at is we, we always look at the mind based on disease, you know, psychology, we focus it on as a disorder, rather than just how the mind works. If we can implement that in early childhood development, help people understand it, they will be much less likely to fall in. Uh, things like identity we were talking about, yep. you know, how, how identity works. If we can teach this early on, and even meditation, mindfulness, yeah. um, I think long term that's the way, because I'm still seeing what we're doing is very reactive. Somebody gets sick, then they find me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, going back to, you know, making money, that seems like the logical thing, but I'm, I'm here really to provide solutions. And so the solution I see is, well, we need to be proactive. And so we need to be focusing on um, giving this information, A, to marginalized communities that really don't have access, that really don't have the help, and also, you know, giving it in, in education, you know, installing it in education. That's what I would like to see. That's the impact I would like Bye Bye Panic to have long term. Um, that's what I would say, yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm happy to have had the opportunity to yeah. get to ask you some questions, too. <laughs> Do you want to end the video? Um, <laughs> if you're anxious, 
knock it off. <laughs> I don't think yeah. that's a great ending. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. We'll keep it. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I mean, man, the, I guess the last thing I would say is just like, thank you for all that, that you do for people in general, but also personally, thank you for how you've helped me. Dude, for sure, man. Cool, cool. Yep.